Um, and I'd like to introduce first uh, Daniel Goldscheider, who is the founder of the Open Wallet Foundation. And I remember when he came to us and he said, I have a great idea, and this is why it needs to be at the Linux Foundation. Uh, so Daniel, if you can please introduce the Open Wallet Foundation, and we can get started with today. And thank you, everybody, for coming, and thank you specifically for Accenture for hosting us here today as well. Thank you, everyone. Uh, First, thank you so much to Accenture for, for hosting us. Uh, when they said they have a room for 50 people, I thought, ooh, this is dangerous, will we get 50 guests? So thank you to you for, for showing up. It's, it's really great to see you and see a couple of familiar faces and a few not so familiar faces. Uh, we started with this idea less than six months ago, and it was really just a conversation of three small companies saying, how about creating basic open source components for digital wallets together. And uh, today we have over 350 companies from trillion dollar companies to billion dollar companies to startups to nonprofits to governments that are interested in creating shared open source components for digital wallets. I am super excited uh, to introduce uh, Ethan Vanneklassen who's going to introduce our panel. Thank you very much for being here. So good morning. Actually, I guess we're afternoon now, sorry. Um, two days into this, I'm already losing my voice, so really grateful to have a microphone. Um, thank you very much. My name is Ethan Vanneklaas, and I lead advocacy and communications at ID2020. If the COVID pandemic taught us anything, it's that we're living more of our lives online. Uh, from school and work to social interactions, financial transactions, uh, you know, kind of you name it. And for billions of people around the world, it's also the way th th that people are increasing a increasingly accessing government services. And so as this trend continues to accelerate, digital wallets excuse me, are going to be the primary user interface that enables individuals to receive, store, and share government-issued IDs, educational credentials, health data, money, and other digital assets, where, when, and with whom they wish. So it goes without saying that digital wallets must be secure, they must be privacy protecting, user controlled and interoperable. But given the central role that we expect them to be playing in all of our lives, <clears throat> excuse me, it's equally important that they're designed to work for all of us, that they're accessible and easy to use. So to be clear, the Open Wallet Foundation is not building a digital wallet, um, rather building bringing together a broad-based coalition of folks, including nonprofits, which we really appreciate, to build an open source wallet engine that will enable wallet providers to build better products <clears throat> that are not only secure and interop interoperable, but are also faster to build and at a lower cost. So it's easy to talk about being a broad-based coalition. It's much harder to actually do what we've learned. Uh, and so the fact that I'm standing here today as a representative of a small nonprofit is really speaks to the foundation's emphasis on making this an inclusive uh, effort. We're an international NGO. We provide tools, technical assistance, and field building uh, activities for the public, private development, and humanitarian sectors to accelerate the implementation and adoption of forward-looking and most importantly, ethical digital ID systems. Since 2016, we've promoted the transformational power of digital ID as a key enabler of social and economic empowerment. And yet, our focus on ethical digital ID demands that we call out the very re real risks that technology, whether it's AI, digital wallets, smart agents, etc., cetera, uh, impose on people, and something that we take very seriously. So when it comes to something as fundamental as our identity, moving fast and breaking things can't be our modus operandi. I just can't. <clears throat> so we're delighted, we're proud to be here today. Truly honored to be presenting such a esteemed panel of speakers, excuse me, uh, and honored to participate. So thank you so much. And with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Angie Lau. She's an award-winning journalist, a dynamic business thought leader, and the co-founder of Forecast Labs. 
with us, Angie. To you. Nathan, thank you so much. I, and and God bless you for sharing your voice with us because I know you've been doing it. It's almost gone. It's almost gone, and it's only the third day. All right. Um, is it? I've also yeah. lost track of time. It, it's it's great to be here, everyone. I, I've been watching this space for the past five years, the way that it has accelerated, <laughs> and watched what David Treat and his team at Accenture Digital Dollar Foundation, all of this dynamism really catapulting us into the next level. And here we are today talking about open wallets. <coughs> Thrilled to be here. This is a critical point in time. I would say it is an inflection point. Uh, obviously, we take a look at the world around us and beyond crypto and blockchain, there's just a lot of challenges. And so we share that. But at the crux of the matter really is the person sitting across from us, wherever they are in the world. And how do we engage? And how do we open up a world of digital innovation and technology for the person sitting across from us, sitting across the seas from us, and uh, around the world? David, Open Wallet's initiative, why is this important? As I, as I think back of, um one of my regrets, actually, is I think back over the past five or six years of, of the work we've been doing, um, I founded a blockchain practice and then, and then merged in together our extended reality practice. We have a word for that. I get to call it our metaverse business, bringing together this thing, this all these concepts. If I think about as, a, as an industry, as an innovation you know, community, we've been thinking about digital identity and digital currency and digital objects separately. Yeah. And really, the value is bringing them all together. And what brings them all together is wallet infrastructure. And so we're very motivated to really think through all of the business model change that can come from that and really get to a model where the winning digital business going forward is the one that earns the most trusted access to my individual wallet with a consumer at the heart of it, thinking through what lovable experience where you we really you know, have you know, safety, security at scale uh, and user agency over, as I think as Ethan said it very well, with whom do you share what for how long and that ability to revoke it. So we see massive business model change. We're excited to bring together what have been far too independent domains of identity, money, and objects, and, uh, and excited to be with just incredible, um, you know, incredible, an incredible community that's forming uh, to, to start to think through how to do that better with the end users really in mind. What's exciting for us with the Open Wallet um, initiative is really uh, codifying, I suppose, uh, open source ethos and development. Um, one of the things um, that we struggle with in the digital currency space is interoperability. Are we building with shared standards? Um, are we working across chains? Um, very similar as we're thinking about wallets and how do we live in a world with multiple wallets and wallets that don't just hold payment mechanisms but also hold healthcare information um, or hold your day-to-day -day cards that you might want to use. Um, you know, most valued person card at the grocery store, for example. Um, but really looking at how do we come together collectively collectively to build what we define as the public good, the infrastructure that everybody's building innovations on top of, and in a way that allows those innovations to flourish and prioritizes the end users' needs. The, it's the users' needs that I think Robert Mahari over at MIT Labs, you've been uh, really observing what those needs are. Uh, you've been tracking the innovation space uh, deeply. Why, why now? for this effort, it's it's a little ironic that in a decentralized world, we do have to come together and figure it all out. Totally, so so I think what's, I can try to project, so, so what's especially exciting for us is not just this technical interoperability, um, but also kind of the regulatory legal interoperability. There are certain sets of legal challenges that as we try to dig digitize and, and use these kinds of products, we're going to have to solve them, and it makes no sense for everybody to go out and solve them by themselves. And so the idea of coming together um, and figuring out, you know, how do we address privacy, for example, uh, in the context of a digital wallet, or uh, compliance and AML, or any of those kind of things, um, and how do we combine that with the, the technology and kind of move away from, you know, these kind of paper paradigms, uh, regulatory paradigms, to kind of automated compliance, automated privacy, privacy by design. Um, that's really quite exciting. And then once the digital wallet um, is out there, 
it seems like it could be an incredible vehicle for data sharing, for using users' data in much more responsible ways. Um, so for example, enabling data trusts or data cooperatives and letting people say, you know, I'm happy for these organizations to use this kind of data in this way. Um, or actually to say, we're going to do computation on the wallet itself. The data never has to leave at all. Um, and we can do some really exciting, innovative things. And so at MIT, we're thinking about these things and kind of trying to um, forecast what is the frontier here um, and what are the open research questions, both technical and regulatory and social. Um, so pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Robert. And, and Patrick, you know, over at Ping Identity, it is something that's top of mind for you and your team. Why are digital wallets so important to digital societies? Um, great question. So for those that don't know, Ping is a, a US software company that provides identity management um, sort of products to large companies that you deal with every day, whether it's banks or healthcare companies, insurance companies, uh, retailers, car manufacturers, airlines, etc., etc., etc. We've been doing that for a number of years. Um, we've been asked for many years, actually, that these companies would prefer not have to deal with identity. They'd like to actually push it back and make it the responsibility of the user, but then it's a risk that they have to take. So uh, for us, this is really the foundation, the starting point of putting uh, identity back in the user's control. We're happy to provide the technology to these companies where they can issue digital credentials or verify, consume digital credentials, but in the middle of that is a wallet. And we feel that, that wallet is critical to the success of this, and uh, we're looking to see a sort of open source sort of reference implementation sort of being a foundational starting point for uh, getting that right, I think. Um, so to have really these end-to-end -end digital processes in place, we have to close the last digital trust line. So we have to enable our customers to use all these services and these processes in a trustful manner. And that's why it is also important for Swisscom to enable our customers with a wallet where they can hold their credentials, um, self sorting and that they have full control about their data. So it's for us a very important element to close the last mile for digital end-to-end -end processes. The trust is critical here. How do you think we achieve that as an open wallet consortium versus a standalone answer? Uh, where, where do you all see where do you all see that? I'm happy to start. I, I, I think we have a I think we've had a really interesting window of time where the where the technologies of it had advanced to a point where we can contemplate things like embedded agents operating within the data that sits within the wallet that then would give the user you know, a, a whole new level of control to basically sever our relationship by kicking that agent out of the wallet, right? Instead of this notion of my data is somewhere else, I would have to trust them to delete it if I wanted to be forgotten. Right. Like, there's some really interesting patterns, architectural patterns and policy patterns and, and usage patterns that we, that we, it's important that we explore because I think we have a very narrow window of time where the next version of the digital world that we live in is gonna emerge and if we don't come together and have the conversations around the the, so the values that we want to apply and, and have those transposed into law you know law regulation policy you know if we don't do it now we'll just be we'll, we will then be subjugated to another innovation wave that then in retrospect we're going to try to fix in hindsight and so we have a really interesting window of opportunity right now with a com with a number of innovation waves coming together where we're about to have big business, business model change we're about to break away from our digital world being constrained to a single flat pl plane of glass that's you know you walk to your laptop or you hold up your phone and our digital world's going to spread you know enormously mm -hmm. you know so critical that we get together and have these conversations and you know and try to drive towards an outcome that we're gonna you know value community by community. What is the value proposition at the end of the day? This group, us here, we, we talk about it very esoterically. Somebody in pick somewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, average town, uh, hard working families um, and they're rushing off their kids to school and they grab their digital wallet, how is this going to improve their life as they engage in a digital economy? What is that world going to be like? And why do they get to do their things better as a result? 
So I can take a shot at that. Um, uh, this is all going to come back really to digital experiences. I mean, the world is going digital. All the interactions you have with um, companies today is all going digital. Um, one of the things we're going to solve is all the issues around identity theft that we've been facing for the last 15 years or more, as more of your identity data has sort of lived inside these organizations. But people aren't going to adopt this unless they see value and whether organizations see value. So an example I gave previously um, was the notion of renting a car. And can I online present a digital driver's license to prove I can drive, then a digital insurance card to prove I'm insured, then a digital credit card to prove I can pay, and then maybe a digital loyalty card to get my discount. Can I do that quickly and easily and um, make it just more efficient for people, more privacy preserving, more secure? Um, that's, that's when we'll see this adoption occur. Okay. I also think there's an inclusion aspect here. Um, so just to broaden the conversation, I do think that is a future, but that is a future. In this current day, why it is so important to have so many stakeholders, um, very diverse range of stakeholders in the conversation now, is because improving the lived experience is very individual. Um, so I would, you know, to use a payments example, right, um, we talk a lot by, oh, if it's digital, we need to figure out what an offline solution might be because there will be moments when a system goes offline. Yes, I agree. And also, we need to think about connectivity and digital divides. So how are we strengthening the systems and the infrastructure that will enable a fully digitized experience or lifetime and investing in those places too? So that we're bringing everyone along and not creating multiple systems that are serving other people better. But the point, to come full circle, is that that is a different experience for, for an individual. And you have to understand that use case to be able to prioritize it as we're talking about these design choices and the other systems that need to evolve to support them. Maybe, maybe, a, maybe just a common everyday one too. When was the, the last time you moved house, how many different places did you go to update your home address? Mm -hmm. right? Like 100, 100 plus, right? Every, every service provider relationship, every authority relationship, right? Mm -hmm. And in, in the US context, there's actually a single source of truth for your home address until you actually go fill out that card either online or in person at the US Postal Service, you are not, you as a human are not definitively associated with that address, right? That is a, and so the whole notion of actually, you know, just taking the whole notion of, of, of changing address, right? You know, the, the, that ability to, to, you know, hold that, that single source of truth address token from the United States Postal Service in, in, our, in, in this US context example, right, then wildly powerful because now I don't have to call 100 different providers. Yeah. It's actually just automatically updated because actually we could, we could then have a model where I don't have to tell the retailer, I want to buy something at a retailer. I don't have to give them my home address. I just have to tell them that, that my delivery organization of choice, FedEx, UPS, USPS, I just have to have them tell tell the delivery provider to give it to me, they're the only ones that need my address. And so just wildly powerful, you know, different architectural business and policy models that we can start to apply that will simplify things like change of address. And then to Jennifer's point, to, to address the needs wherever they are in the world, in India where you don't even have identity, uh, let alone sometimes even a cell phone, and so in America, absolutely, right, that's the system that we have in place. In Europe, it's a different system. In, in uh, much of Africa, uh, across Asia, there's different and disparate ways. Um, how are all the teams working together? Uh, this is almost a, a, almost a governance question. You know, when, when people are coming into a room and they're participating in what that open wallet open source technology is going to look like, what the base layer of that technology is going to look like to create hopefully a, a much more standardized, elegant way in which we can all kind of communicate with each other. How, how does, how has, how, how do you overcome maybe some of the challenges? What are some of the challenges? And, uh, you know, how, how do you overcome it? So, what, so, from Pete's perspective, um, Identity has been an interoperability problem for 20 years, and we've invested in open standards in different open standards organizations to essentially ensure that if you were going to participate and use this technology, you weren't going to be locked into ping software because nobody wants to be locked into just ping. It has to work across multiple implementations for multiple vendors. 
So I think this is just an evolution of that. Um, we're sort of you now you know, working on standards to make this all interoperable in uh, sort of organizations like the ISO, IETF, um, places like that. Um, all those vendors are comfortable participating there, and we're going to come together in the uh, Open Wallet Foundation, not to work on sort of the standards per se, but essentially on sort of a reference implementation of how to use those standards. So the same people will be there working on that as well, and contributing code and stuff like that. Andreas, what it, how does the telecoms um, space think about Open Wallet and, and to bring that conversation back to the industry? Mm, I think. As I said, right, for, for us it is important that um, the user is in the center of this wallet. And for us this wallet is really an enable factor. And I think as, as long as it is an open uh, foundation as we have it here, where probably the best brains work together to find the best solution, I think that's the ambition that we should all have to have such a critical element in place which enables also the global society, and you mentioned the inclusion, right? I think that's our whole goal, that we build a solution which everyone can use and where we have this uh, inclusion in place. Can I, I, that's, I, you just sparked a thought for me. I'm going to invoke MIT here. I think one of the ways that we get there, that we have done in the past, um, but I don't think we've done frequently, is really heavily investing in public-private partnerships and being able to use the resources and the expertise of the private sector that really has put that user experience at the center of what they built for a long time now. Um, and I think having both technologists and policymakers at the table together, so taking the technical conversations out of the Open Wallet Foundation, and bringing that forward and exposing our policymakers and helping educate them and giving them a voice at that table as well so we can understand the push and pull between uh, law and tech or reg regulation and tech, right, is very important and MIT has done a, a great job with that um, thus far with the Project Hamilton work, right, right. Um, is, is a real life use case that we've seen in action. Yeah, and in general, it seems like there's these kind of genuine design questions here, right? So for, for example, you know, when we've tried to approach privacy, we said we want people to, to have more of a role, we want people to like give their consent, informed consent, but it puts a lot of onus on the user um, in ways that are sometimes just inconvenient, but other times kind of unfair, right? Because we, we ask people to you know, take, take the reins in, in ways that they might not necessarily be able to do. Um, and I think it's a very similar context here, right? Where we're thinking about, on the one hand, we want, we want a trusted system, uh, on the other hand, we want self-sovereignty. We want people to be able to consent to what's being done and what's not being done. Um, but we also don't want to put too much of an onus on, on users. And there's some kind of degree of, I don't know, you want to not be paternalistic, but at the same time keep people safe, um, especially with this inclusivity piece. Um, and so kind of doing research on that, which includes kind of bringing people together, having focus groups, doing panels, doing seminars at MIT, things like that, I, I think genuinely adds value and, and it helps us solve some of these problems um, in more informed, kind of data-driven, evidence-driven ways. So yeah, this is this is actually where I see the the opportunity with the Open Wallet Foundation is to really drive a lot of innovation in uh, in how wallets are going to work. What's the user experience going to be like? A comment I made before is that we're still living with browsers today. It's a paradigm that was created in 1994. All right, it hasn't changed. So I think there's I, I don't know what the right wallet experience actually is because um, I think there's so much to do with sort of user experience, privacy, uh, you know, making it simple, but you know, you're hiding a lot of complexity behind the scenes and ensuring that we don't deal with this common click-through problem that we've had as well. There's some big challenges, and I think it's only in sort of an open forum we can actually drive out a lot of innovation in that way. I, I think it's also, I mean, just to, you know, with Danielle here in the front row, I mean, I think the other, the other thing that makes us incredibly excited and, and confident in where we're headed, it's that convening the right groups, Step one, but doing it within the Linux family and the and the support that we get from you know, the, the the you know the place to run you know open open source projects and the governance that comes along with that is just you know is amazing. Pulling that together with obviously you know MIT's you know capabilities and convening and and you know open source and so we just we have the powerhouse you know group together. Uh, so just that's a huge confidence builder and, um, and then Danielle is wonderful. So this is just going to be. Do you think it's going to be like the super app that we're seeing pop up in Asia? Uh, you, you can't do anything, it feels like, uh, unless you have one of these apps to buy anything, get around, public transportation, I mean, you name it. 
let alone banking. Is that something that, that's, a, that's a relevant framework? What are the, what are the observations that you've made, uh, what you want to improve on, and or what you think is a good reference? I'm happy, I'm happy to start with the other way. Well, it's a I, if, I, if I build, if I, if I building on the, I think building on the comments, right, the, the, if it isn't lovable, if it isn't lovable, it's not going to scale, right? It's got to be, it's got to be intuitive, it's got to be easy, it's got to be, lo, you know, lovable, lovable to use. And I think the feedback, you know, I think where we, some of the wallets, you know, that, um, you know, been invented recently, maybe have not, you know, not been as lovable as they need to be. I think that, I think being able to get to that point is going to be, you know, is going to be a critical part of this. I think from well, why participate and how should brands and companies with their service providers and authorities think about why to lean in on this, I think it is also then the competition frontier. I think the notion of what a, what a winning business in the previous digital period was, was could you harvest the most possible data off of a network or buy it or, or secure mm -hmm. it, and then, and then we high five each other if we get a 4% hit rate on an ad campaign, right? Very blunt and, and ineffective, and at one point, one of the credit unions had my year of birth wrong, and I was getting all sorts of happy, you haven't signed up for the AARP yet, yeah, and I was, I was, they thought I was 102, but the, you know, the, you know, we have a very blunt, ineffective system right now because it, because everybody you know, we have to give away our data at every relationship and then yeah. and, and then all the outtrades and the like and so the, you know, the I think the reason for everyone to lean in is I think enabled by this this and you know, it, ironically enabled by the end users having control over their own identity money and objects actually provides a whole different basis to try to earn their trust and it'll change the nature of marketing and branding and and and, a, and not a six point font basis for the exchange of, of information, right? Of you know, terms and conditions that no one ever reads and you just have to. And so being able to, to rethink marketing, branding, and the relationships is gonna drive a huge amount of lean in. That doesn't mean everyone, it would be dystopian if we had a wallet per thing. We don't want that. No. I think it'd also be similarly dystopian if we only had one wallet you know, in total. So there's some, you know, there's some mix. Um, but we're going to get into a really interesting period where we can have a much more valuable relationship between end users and uh, and the service providers and authorities they work with, and how much fun will that be to figure out and work together? So, I, oh, go, go ahead, please. Well, I was going to say, I actually think one of the goals for Ping participating is actually for us not to be in a position where there's only two large entities providing wallet infrastructure for the world. Um, the goal here is to allow for user choice and for different wallets to exist that users take advantage of and, and you know and, and sort of have different reasons for using different ones and stuff like that. So we could start there. I mean generally speaking the world always consolidates to one, but I don't want to start with the one or two. Let's at least start with an open place. But see that's the brilliant thing about the open wallet uh, participation. It really in a way democratizes as best it can in a in a private manner of corporations and organizations made up of people, right, in the most diverse way possible to create a universal operating system. Yeah, so I, I'm going to add both of those, and I'm going to take it one step uh, beyond, which is to say, um, it, you're, you're um, I just forgot my thought, totally forgot it in that moment. <laughs> On a panel, it'll come back. It'll come back, it'll come back, back to me. I'll interrupt we someone. Yeah. 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 We don't want we don't want a wallet for everything. We do want to. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm on it. Thank you. Um, right. So my hypothesis, and it's the same for digital currency, right? There's two pieces. If we develop the bottom layer openly and together, we raise the bar on the standards, which raises the level of trust, right? Um, and then second, I would wager, same with digital currency. Whoever figures out how to protect privacy and make that uh, presentable in a very plain English way is going to win over the masses because I think that is where we are seeing a lot of diversity right now in how we're prioritizing and balancing the choices between security and privacy, how we're reflecting our individual countries' principles right through privacy. It's the same concept. Um, so I'm super excited about the innovation because I, and I will hypothesize, well, next year we'll come back, see how far we've gotten. Has privacy been an edge for anyone uh, in terms of adoption or development? Well, it's share the vision. What's the vision? You, you all have a rapt audience, uh, including myself. What does my wallet look like? 
uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. What does it look like for my family? What does it look like for my children, child? Uh, and uh, so, so what, what does that, what's that vision? Ultimately, as you do the important work right now, if we had figured out all the issues and had the most number of participants, even from the regulatory level, what what is the ultimate goal? Happy. Andreas. <laughs> 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 I, I try, right? Yeah. So I think it is really about my vision to digitize trust. So whatever is. Uh, related to a physical document right now, which creates trust so that we have that with the same functionality, with the same feature as we know it from the offline world in terms of privacy, to have the control, to have it with me, to decide who has access to these uh, information, that we can replicate that to the digital world. And of course, some additional features, right, where we can, um, let's say, decouple certain attributes from a document and just show the relevant one, mm -hmm. maybe also put some logic on top of it. So. The, I think the benchmark is what we have right now in the physical world, but then put on top some add-ons which make it more better and not worse. I mean, I don't have to file a, a hundred applications <laughs> to tell them that I changed anything. So you, that's the challenge. That is the challenge. What you just described is the challenge. So I'm not a design person, but if we're making something that users have to think about, it has to, it's going to have to be intuitive. It's going to be, have to be something that uh, is going to be na very natural for them to use. It probably won't even feel like a wallet. We might not even call it a wallet. But they might not even understand it as a wallet. But it might be their personal data store, as an example of some word people used before. Um, and it's got to be something that uh, is fail-safe. Because if I lose my phone or my device, I can't be... Uh, I, I notice there's a few crypto blockchain uh, companies here. I can't be using a 24 seed like phrase to recover my wallet uh, for this to scale, as an example. So there's a lot of challenges and stuff we have to sort of solve, but it's, you know, we got, you know, you got to rethink that. The, the state of the art today isn't good enough, and uh, it's going to have to improve. But optionality to get there, right? Because it's going to take a while, and there will be, you know, we'll be bridging for a long time. So it's if I want to fully immerse and operate with my wallet, that's great. If my husband doesn't, um, then he has the option to turn on and off what functionality he wants through his wallet as well. Yeah. And without it, without it being a, an obstacle to any standard thing of engagement, right? We don't have to sign away anything, including our first child, to get on. <laughs> yeah, Br my bridging, favorite app, bridging right? to this future is is key because no no organization is suddenly going to jump to this. Right. All right, we're going to go through a transition period. So how do you deal with the transition period where some people have wallets, some people don't? All right, how do we handle that experience and stuff like that? So it, it, again, it's uh, it, 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 it has to be somewhat of an evolution. I don't think this can be revolution, no, no matter how exciting it is, because nobody's going to adopt it. Couldn't, I agree with that. everything that's been said, and, and I'm going to reference a colleague in Chatham House rule style. I, I won't attribute this, but it made a fantastic point that just underscored that we haven't talked about is this is also not just about um, the individual human, but you know the identity of things. You know that that the, the, the you know identity of things. I'll go to pets. I was just with a pet company. Like there's a the, and then the nested relationships. I'm going through some very complicated identity things that have incredible intensity in my household right now with three teenagers and the realization that that we signed on with the, you know their gamer IDs were on my email address and now they want to have like the the parent child relationship the the things that this is a this is a big space in our ability to rethink you know rethink it so that we can make it can make it a simplifying force you know it, you know for business model transformation and user experience so you know lovable simplifying engaging uh, safe secure it's a piece a huge ask but but I can't think of a more important one as we get into the next digital, digital period and something that you're engaging with regulators on um, hopefully and, and in the future at what kind of experience um, education that you think that regulators need to understand as as the open wallet um, efforts move forward. I mean, I think that everything gets wrapped up in, in fears around you know, crypto and money laundering and things like that. And like, as soon as you say any of these things, yeah. like suddenly. But but I, I think you know you asked what what's the vision, and I think there's this intermediate vision for me, which is to have a a menu of components that have been designed 
with regulators, with designers, with whoever is, is kind of relevant to say, okay, can we import GDPR, right? I want to build a new wallet, import GDPR, import Bank Secrecy Act, import, you know, whatever, whatever kind of things I want, or lovable design, right? Um, or simple design, or, or things like that, and then allow people to go out and create wallets for different kind of contexts, right? Whether that's a developing country context where you're saying, we want to be able to do it without smartphones, um, or whether that's a context where you're saying, okay, we want a corporate wallet for, for a company with 100,000 employees, you know, they're going to have wallets too. And they're going to look different, but they're going to have some of the same components. And, and it feels that sunlight is kind of a good disinfectant here, where if we design those components in an open source way, then people can trust them. Um, and then they can be packaged up, and we know kind of what the ingredients were, uh, but then you can have a standalone product that people can use for different contexts. So that's, to me, really exciting. And can I add to the regulatory question? Um, because regulators are people just like us. Um, and it's, I'm going to, exactly. So I just call to action here. Um, they need to learn. We know the best way to learn is through uh, relatable use cases by um, safe places to touch the technology and learn about it and breaking things up into um, small, sizable chunks. So we can't go to them and say, this is the regulation we want that will allow us to do all of the things and it should work for the next 50 years. But we can go to them and we can say, we would really like to lean in on global standard setting. We think it's very important for X country to be a leader in this conversation. This is independent of discussions around whether we're deploying CBDCs or we need to have government wallets. This is important and it's a foundational place for us to participate. That is manageable, right? And then through that experience, they learn. So I would encourage everyone to reach out to your regulators, to your policymakers, your legislators, and talk to them in any opportunity you can get. It might feel a little Groundhog-esque day, Groundhog Day, I don't know if that resonates um, in a global audience, but um, you know, do it, do the work, because it will give you results, and they're hungry for it. Um, they're just limited in how they can reach out. That's my PSA for the panel. <laughs> Uh, last words. I, oh, last words. Gosh, that's a pressure. Um, <laughs> I, I suppose if I channel that, I, that also, I, if I add to that, I think also the, do it where we're not stuck in a swim lane. Because I think too many of the too many of the conversations we're having, we're we're in the digital currency swim lane and stuck there, or we're in the digital identity you know, lane and stuck there. And and our ability through this effort to really say that you know with most everything right the, the transaction or an interaction you you have at least a combination of two or three of those things between identity you know, identity currency objects and services the, the the interrelationships between the two and to have a framework to be able to have that discussion drive that education and have standards that apply across the board if we don't we need to have that foundational layer to then get to simplified lovable scalable mm -hmm. inclusive. And everyone on this panel is looking to get it right, to include as many voices at the table so that we could serve the greater whole and make it lovable. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to once again thank everyone for coming. Um, we were talking about digital trust, um, and the Open Wallet Foundation is a new initiative at the Linux Foundation uh, <coughs> around digital trust. So I hope everybody here in this room scans the QR code or it just goes to openwalletfoundation.org. Um, we are convening our members, many that are here on stage, many that are here in the audience as well. Um, and we welcome you to participate, bring your developers, bring your, uh, your strategy people. Um, we are here and we're gonna build digital trust and open wallets together. So thank you all for joining us today and feel free to ask any of us questions that you might have. Thank you.